Okay. I guess I'll share my screen. Yeah. Yep. Uh, hopefully the audio is coming through okay. I can hear you fine. Okay, nice. Okay. Yep. I see PowerPoint. Next. Yep. All right. It is all you. Yay. Okay, I'll start my uh, own stopwatch thing. And so, uh, hi all, I'm Tino, and I'll be talking about game dance, uh, specifically my experience in releasing eight uh, dance games through game dance in the past few years, and when to take a break from game dance. So, uh, as a quick like uh, thing before I start talking, I'll just give a quick like introduction of myself. So I'm Tino, I make Yuri games. Uh, for the most part, I'm a director, scenario writer, and character artist. And basically, I'll be talking about game dance in the context of releasing eight Yuri visual novels between 2020 and 2021 uh, through game dance. And currently, I'm working on a Steam release of one of the dance games that I made last year, as well as an unannounced project that I might be talking about later this year on my Twitter. But yeah, games, game dance. So as an overview of this presentation, I'll be talking about three main things. Uh, the first one is basically how to game jam, some tips I've learned through basically participating in a shit ton of game jam, uh, some lessons that I've learned from game jamming as like a director, co-director, and like a solo dev and stuff like that, as well as the question, did you participate in game jam? So I'll answer that question now as like a conditional yes, but hopefully you'll be able to figure out should you yourself participate in game jam once I finish this uh, presentation. So game jams are commonly one month long like development periods where you make a game from scratch. And I'm basically giving this talk assuming you already know what a game jam is. So I won't go too much into depth on what game jams are. But just have a note, whenever I talk about um, time related stuff, I'll be talking about it in the context of a one month long game jam, since most big jams like Nano Reno or Spooktober are one month long. So uh, let's just uh, get started with the game jam timeline of like, you know, how do you game jam? Like, how do you make a game in a game jam? So there's like four main steps that you'd probably want to keep in mind. The first one is planning, followed by recruiting a team, and then like developing your game, and then whatever you want to do after release and releasing, of course. So not all of them have to be completely separate from each other. They might actually overlap a bit in your timeline, develop uh, depending on how you like to make games. So I'll just go through them in order. So when it comes to planning, uh, I'd say you probably want to keep in mind the four main points. So like your premise and making an outline for what type of like story you're going to make. So as well as what the scope of your game is. Like, do you want to make a pretty long game or do you want to make a really short game? And as well as basically visual references. So with the premise, well, your idea is your idea. And I can't really give any advice on having an idea. Uh, similarly for outline, like, However you write is probably however you write, but I'll make a few comments on scope and visual references. So basically when it comes to scope, I think it's been mentioned a few times in many talks that you should keep your scope small and cut it down and whatnot. And basically I'll basically reiterate that in you should keep your scope small, but that doesn't mean you have to continuously make like tiny, tiny games for game jams all the time just because a game jam is a relatively short period of time in which you're making a game, but rather you can use game jams as a way to kind of inform yourself of how much work can you actually get done in one month. So you can see through these uh, four games that I worked on for game jams, where I was the writer for most of them and sometimes the artist, that basically throughout uh, the jams, I would slowly increase my word count for the jam game. But that was because I basically figured out that I could actually write that much in a month without having to basically crunch or anything like that. But overall, just like keep the scope small and maybe you can increase it if you do a lot of jam games. And then visual references. So you might be thinking that you want to make a jam game by yourself like solo dev, or that you're like doing it with someone else and you never have to draw because drawing is so much work and it's like, yeah, you don't want to do it. But you will thank yourself if you make visual references because they're not only like it's good for kind of figuring out a design for your characters, but they're also really good for recruitment because when people kind of reach out to you being like, oh, I see that you made this interesting post in DevTalk or some other place, they'll be like, 
So do you have any uh, references or like character design ideas like that? And if you can show them something, then they're a lot more likely to actually kind of join in with you and, you know, help you make your game. And additionally, even once you get past the planning portion of the thing, uh, your artist will thank you because it's like a lot easier for them to just like look at a picture and be like, oh, I can just look at the picture and like take the colors from the picture instead of being like, hey, director, about the character, how do you draw them? What's the color of the hair? It's like, it's 3 a.m. on the third week of the jam. And I don't know how to do this because you never told me how to do it. So it'll just basically make your life so much easier if you have some sort of visual reference for your artist or for yourself for the jam. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a drawing. It can also be like photos or like basically pictures of other anime girls or whatever the heck you want. Yep. But then like, so once you have your kind of like scope, premise, and et cetera down, uh, you'll probably want to recruit people unless you're doing the jam solo. And so you might be thinking, so how do I get people interested in working on my game for the jam? Uh, so for that, I would recommend more or less like uh, answering these five points. But uh, in some platforms and stuff like that, you might not actually have space to kind of like answer all those questions. And of course, you don't actually need to answer like every single question. But for the most part, I would recommend uh, focusing on these two points, the premise of your game and what role you're looking for. And so I'll just give, basically give you two examples of some recruitment pieces I made that were relatively successful in getting people to uh, like basically come and make the game with me. So here's a chunk from a longer recruitment post that I made in the dev talk server, where basically I have like the whole premise of the game, followed by uh, we are searching for XYZ, and also like a DM me with examples of work, blah, blah, blah. So basically it just tells the, like any possible like teammates, like what is this game about? What role am I searching for? And basically kind of like, a, just so we don't waste our time, uh, give me examples of your work if you're interested before like we really get into it. But uh, you might also want to recruit on Twitter. In that case, like you might have a shorter type of recruitment post with just like the, mm, the genre as well as like the list of roles that you're thinking for. But just uh, as a note, you should never be like, oh, my game is so unique. I don't want you to steal my ideas. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. Like don't do that. Like your game might be amazing. But if you don't tell people what your game is about, they're not going to help you make your game. So yeah, that's basically it about recruitment. But once you have uh, your teammates recruited, you should also discuss these following topics. And I added this like red arrow over here because a lot of people won't actually discuss this one. So they'll be like, oh, I know them as Bob from the community. So I'll just uh, attribute them as Bob. But Bob might want to be attributed as Robert in your game. And while like Bob won't get angry at you for attributing him as Bob, uh, he, he'll be a lot happier if he's attributed as Robert. So here's just like an extra note to check in on their preferred attribution. But what if you can't get someone to be your game jam buddy and you're really sad because no one applied or everyone who applied just didn't have the style you were looking for? Well, the solution is basically to either reach out to people if such people exist out there or give up. But that doesn't mean to like just like not make your game, but rather you should start a contingency plan, which might be to just do it yourself or uh, basically get some CC assets or get an asset tag or anything like that. Because yeah, I could give a whole talk about how like the sky BZ is the best thing ever, but sometimes your game will be better if you just uh, make some compromises and use like asset packs and CC assets and stuff like that when you can't like get teammates. Yep. But let's just say that you manage to get your team or as much of the team that you can get. And of course you have to organize it. So there is the option to kind of like manage everyone separately. But personally, I would uh, do this method where basically you have like one home base with the all the communication such as like Discord and then places where you keep all your like, like game stuff such as like Google Drive and Git. So for Discord, I typically like to organize it kind of like this, where there's like the channels with read-only information that's like important information, such as like Google Drive links and stuff like that, as well as just like general game information. 
and then a section for discussion, as well as uh, some panels for specialized discussions. Since your artist might have a lot of questions, or like you might just want to talk a lot about the art in your game, stuff like that. So you'd have like art discussion, jury discussion, music discussion, and stuff like that. Of course, like depending on the composition of your team, you might not have all creative areas. So basically, I would just like make panels based off of who is in the team for the jam. And then um, basically, so you might be asking, so about that Git thing, like I'm not a coder, like do I really need that? So, well, honestly, like no, but like yes, because uh, when you're making your game, you might be thinking that a visual novel does not have that much code, which is, well, I don't know about that assumption, but sometimes even if it's a pretty simple game with just basically like basic vampire high scripting, just like that, you might have a lot of extra versions. And for one of the games I worked on, it was Red Queen, it basically ended up like this. So our game was not like super simple, but it wasn't like the complexity of making OS in Rampai. And so at that time, we were thinking, it should be okay if we just use Google Drive. And it basically turned into this, which while is acceptable, can probably be a lot easier if you just use some other form of version control, which is why I recommend using something like it for your uh, game. And then uh, once you have like your organization set up, you should also uh, make sure you answer some like simple questions that every uh, every project will have, such as like the file type, the engine, the asset specs, and like if you're compensating them at all. So for most jam jam games, you probably won't be like having money having hands since it's basically like uh, one month or even shorter period of development time. But basically, just uh, make sure you address these types of things early, so they won't have to be asked like two weeks into the project where they'll be like, hey, uh, by the way, what size do you want the CDs? Could I just do them in 720p and the game is in 1080p or something like that? So, like, you don't want that to happen, and it's so easy to just like make a note that this is what we want, not something else. So after you have your like planning and your recruitment done, you'll probably be heading into development. So here's a rough developmental timeline that's kind of amalgamated from several experiences I had. I typically adjust for weekends because like you basically want your teammates to have as many weekends as they can do their stuff since uh, basically most of the people who are doing the end of are probably like working a full-time job or a student or something like that. So they won't be able to just like work on your game 24 seven all the time during week days and stuff like that. But however you make your uh, developmental timeline, I recommend that for release, you have like a bit of a buffer just in case something goes wrong or like you have to do some like last minute stuff that was added in. So in this example, there's a three day buffer for release. So you might be thinking, well, timelines are great and all, but like how do I prevent delays from throwing me off from the timeline and basically preventing you from making the game in time for the jam? So for art delays, uh, basically it comes down to planning. The sooner you plan the art, the better. So if you have an outline, you can tell the CD artist the themes that you want. And if you have designs, you can basically like be like, here's the design. And the CD artist or the character artist doesn't have to spend time to create designs and whatnot. Yeah, overall just like reject art crunch, do more planning. Uh, but still, you might, even if your teammates are super awesome, there can be issues where basically they have to, they're unable to complete their part for the jam. Like they could catch COVID or they could just like ghost you. The best case scenario is that they actually like tell you that they can't do it, but they might just like disappear into the void never to be seen again. So I would recommend checking in on them, uh, maybe like partway through the jam or have like weekly check-ins or whatever, but that's kind of up to you. But if they fall through, and eh, like, what do you do about that? So the solution could be multiple things. Like you can do it yourself. You could accept the delay and basically just not get the game done in time for the jam. You could try recruiting new teammates or you can cut scope. Like all of these are totally valid options. So for me, like sometimes I just end up doing it myself. And like, for example, for this game and their feelings like water, um, the sprite artist was unable to do it due to like COVID issues. So I just like drew two sprites in like the last minute and the game was released. Yay. And that comes to kind of like the topic of the scope knife. 
which was mentioned in the previous presentation. So usually you really want to try not to scope up. Scope down if you can and if you need to during the jam. But you know, like games are probably your baby and you want to tell the story and you don't want to cut anything out. And I totally get that. So uh, alternatively, you can kind of ignore the device by just adding extra buffer time for the release. So for Who is the Red Queen, which I mentioned earlier, uh, it was like one of the longer jam games I made. So I made kind of a note in the document for it to cut down scope if like stuff wasn't going on schedule. And it kind of didn't happen even though I was like not on schedule. Uh, but somehow it worked out in the end because like we had extra buffer time for release. And we still managed to get the game done like before the last day, which was pretty great. But overall like scope down. And then by this point, you'll probably have your game finished, developed in some way. And um, so the analytics chart will probably look something like this, with the peak in the beginning. So for it, like, it does have the like whole new game algorithm thing, where your game will get a bit of boost in visibility. But with game jams, there's also the perk of basically you'll get some views from people who are just like interested in the jam in general or like the theme of the jam. But at the same time, I recommend to still like actually market your game and whatnot. But whatever you do with the game after you release it, well, that's basically up to you. And I won't talk about it in this talk because I would go over time by a lot if I tried to. So now that I've given a pretty rough uh, go through of how to game jam, I'll do some lessons that I learned through game jamming as like a team lead solo developer and also as like uh, just a contributor a project. So these three games I directed as like the single director. So basically if you are directing a game, you'll find that you have like high creative control in exchange for responsibility to kind of like keep everything together and organize people. But it's also great because you get to meet amazing people you might work with again. So you might be thinking, so what if I just co-direct with a buddy or something like that? So well you'll have like a little bit less creative control. But it's pretty good, except you need to be really, really good at communication six speed. Because you might be thinking, my buddy and me, we can just read each other's lines. Well, it turns out you really can't do that. And it can actually turn out to be a bit more work than just directing by yourself. Because you have to make sure that you and your co-director are like lining up in talk. So then you're thinking, OK, so people are annoying. I don't want to talk to anyone ever. So I'll just make it myself. So you basically get full creative control, which is great. But then there's like stuff because unless you're like a super powerful jack of all trades, you're probably not going to be able to do everything as you want it to be. And there won't be other people as like an external motivation factor for you to actually get the game done. So you're thinking, OK, making a game, that sounds like a lot of work. What if I just want to make one if I don't want to be in charge of it? So well, if you're a contributor, it's pretty good too. But you have low creative control and you might have like situations where it's a bit director dependent. So uh, personally, I'm not into it, but you might enjoy working under other people to make games. Yep. So um, from this talk, you can probably tell that I'm kind of like a little bit addicted to game jam, but even so, I decided to take a break. So you might be asking, why did I decide to take a break if I love game jam so much that I've like basically done game jams for like eight plus games. Well, here's a quick list of pros and cons of game jams. And I won't read through the entire list because that would take a lot of time. But you'll notice that short term project is in both the pros and cons. Basically, uh, the games that you make for game jams are small, which allows you to take more risks and whatnot. But at the same time, they're like, they're small. You can't make your like amazing Kamige, Chunige, like Save Day Night, whatever through a game jam, unless you're like crunching and you have a time machine. So that leads to my moratorium on jam, where basically I wanted to make a different scope of game, something that was a longer game, something that I would like polish a lot more, maybe like pour like a mountain of money into, and also be unconstrained by like the themes, the deadlines and whatnot of a jam. And as it happens, Trying to do both jams and a long-term project at the same time uh, typically probably won't work out because, so here's a little anecdote 
about this one time I tried to work on a long-term project while also doing jam. And I wrote a whole outline, character design, whatever, even had a demo. But the thing is, every time a jam came around, I would be like, ooh, shiny. And I would do the jam, so the game never got finished or even close to finished. And I realized, yeah, got to take a break from jam sometimes. So here's a bit of a tree diagram for you uh, to help you figure out if you should participate in a jam. You can screenshot it or also just like post the PowerPoint in the Big Guy Project uh, Discord. And yeah, so basically, should you participate in game jam? Uh, yes, but conditionally. And it's always OK to take a break from them to make a longer game or whatever you want to do. And yep, thank you for listening. Uh, comments, questions, concerns? You can, go to follow, you can also uh, follow me at the following places. Yay. Yay. All right, there's a question someone, OK. When you're working in a team project and a director didn't already have character designs thought out, how are the character designs decided upon? Is it a team effort, or does the sprite artist propose starter designs? Um, I would basically, like, either is fine, but you should just make sure that you actually, the director has made the decision to do it. Since sometimes I'll just let the artist, like, do whatever, and it tends to work out pretty OK. But if you, like, don't say that you want the artist to do it, then, like, it might get a little messy. All right, and then someone asked, something I find with writing as opposed to art is that I need to go away, then come back later, period, before I can edit with fresh eyes. But I feel that a jam time frame doesn't accommodate that. Do you have any advice for polishing a project while it's still so new? Um, so I would say that if you have kind of like trouble looking at it with fresh eyes, it doesn't hurt to get a uh, editor on board. So like you'll have to get your script done a bit earlier if you're doing it for jam, but editor can definitely help you get your game like a bit more polished for jam. Cool. Any more questions? Oh, someone says, uh, do you find you have the urge to go back to your jam projects afterwards to polish it and broaden the scope? Do you think that's a bad or risky thing or should you just let it go? Uh, to be honest, like I just kind of like let them sit in the dust. But for I did mention that I'll be polishing one of the jam games I worked on. So who is the Red Queen for a Steam release? Uh, basically, like it's fine to polish it, but you have to make sure that like your team is kind of like on board for it. So they might have like signed up for it. Basically, this game is just for a jam. And, like they don't want it to be. They might not want it to be something that's like bigger like that. So you have to make sure like everyone is on board with it before you get, you know, like further with it, I guess. All right. Any more questions? Okay. So what is uh, compensation like on a game jam versus a commercial game release for a team? Um, so I haven't actually worked on a commercial game, but typically I'd say game jams tend to be free games. So some people might do the whole like they split the revenue evenly. But the thing is with Steam Jam games, I don't think you'll actually expect there to be much revenue. So like unless you want to split pennies that'll get consumed by like I don't know like PayPal transaction fees. So I would usually just say like jam games are probably gonna be free or like kind of like paid in like a commission type of work or whatever. Cool. Someone's asking, is it common for a writer to bring in, say, a full short story written ahead of time, or is this against the spirit of a one month jam? Um, I think it depends on the jam. I think, like, for example, Scooptober, at least for the like rules last year, it was basically like you had to write everything fresh. But for like some jams, like a winter jam or like I think Sunofest, it's like it's totally fine to have like stuff created beforehand. And the jam is like more like a motivation for you to actually like make a game and make it like by a deadline or something like that. So you don't just have something floating in the void forever. That's never going to get finished. OK, a bunch of people want to just make a comment saying that the birds are adorable. Yeah, birds are great. <laughs> 